Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 92. For those of you new to the show, I'm comedian Simon Kane, and this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio and today, talent agencies. Mike Lee is the founder of MLA Talent. They're not just a talent agency though, they also produce a lot of free digital content and media online, particularly in podcasts, where they own their own podcast network to share audiences. I got him on to talk about how he represents his acts, both on and off stage, and on and offline, and how their online audiences have translated to offline audiences. This interview would be really good for any act looking to develop an online audience, or someone who already has an online audience, but wants to try and translate it to a real world one, and doesn't really know how to do it. It'd also be good for anyone who's trying to find an agent, and this is full of advice on the do's and don'ts, and the the things that annoy him and annoy all agents in their capacity and the job that they do. Thank you very much to JD Henshaw from the Sweets venue and the whole Sweets venue, in fact, for giving me a quiet place to record this show. Uh, I think it was at 9 a.m. I think at one point in the interview, Mike points out it is bloody early. I got up very early every day to record these. So uh, if you'd like to thank JD or the Sweets venue, there are links in the show notes or you can Google them. Please do say thank you because it does show that there is an appreciative audience out there. And frankly, it's a lovely thing to do. So thank you very much, JD. If you're new here, please do hit the subscribe button. If you're old, here please do consider giving us an honest review in itunes they really help the show seriously take a minute write something nice doesn't have to be particularly long that's what she said i'm better than that i can't believe i said that just basically you think you'd think i would have edited that out just do a review that would really appreciate it but for now without any more delays this is mike lee uh my drive for setting up mla um and leaving the other agencies i worked for was to basically work for myself and work the hours I wanted to do and earn the money that was actually bringing in. That's kind of why I think most people eventually set up by themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I think most people obviously start at agencies, uh, bigger agencies or, or whatever, um, and then get to a stage when you sort of think, you know what, I just want to do this myself and hopefully depending on what deals you've done, take the clients that you've kind of found and nurtured with you and, and, and do it that way, really. I think, you know, a lot of you sort of look at all the sort of what I call big individual agents rather than the massive companies. Everyone kind of ends up doing that, really, at some stage. Okay. And if I were to say what makes you different, if you were to, like, pitch it to, to performers, if right. they wanted to work <coughs> with you, what, what, where do you see yourself within? Well, the- um, I think I'm quite a hands-on agent. Um, I think I do more than just, you know, negotiating deals, looking for work, that kind of thing. I think with a lot of my clients, I kind of produce some of their work. We're here in Edinburgh and there's a couple of shows on that I'm producer of as well. Uh, So I get quite involved, if I think it's necessary, if an artist is at a certain level or we're trying to shift what they're doing. I do tend to get quite hands-on and, and involved. So I think I'm sort of, I wouldn't say I'm a manager, but I think I'm, I'm sort of in the middle between an agent and a, and a manager for a lot of my, not so much actors, but a lot of my comedy performers, I think. The ones who are sort of doing their own thing rather than you know learning someone else's script and showing up for a job. For ones who are doing Edinburgh or comedy shows and tours and characters, um, quite hands-on. And when you say like trying to help them with their direction, is it? Would you say that you work for them or they work for you? How how does that dynamic work? I've, it's a good question. I've I've always kind of seen it as a collaborative thing. I I I, I, I never understand when I speak to sort of any kind of performers who sort of go oh you know oh I'm scared when I call my agent or oh, I never speak to my agent I never speak to my assistant I'm thinking why aren't don't when you first sat down and decided to work together then you kind of agree at that level what you know you know you say to a prospective client what's your goal what's your aim where do you want to be you know then you're honest and go yep I can help with that or no not my world um so I see it as a collaborative thing I I, I just see it as it's something you you do together really um so based on that what would you say you uh, probably a better question here would be what do you say you don't do because what you do do um what i don't do i mean I, I, I did many years ago when i started out but i sort of draw the line at being that kind of agent stroke manager that is on call 24 hours a day you know oh i've got locked out oh i'm stuck at this bar can you get me into this party can you do that that kind of hands-on manager stuff i, I, I 
I, I steer clear of. I've had it before mm. with certain clients and realized this is not for me. That I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this. So I think that's kind of where I draw the line when it comes to that kind of personal stuff of, can you sort me out? Oh, I need a, need a plumber and, and all that kind of stuff, which some sort of managers well, obviously have, have to do. They have to get involved in those sort of things. But I try and keep it, you know, kind of strictly professional. Mm. And in terms of your remit of professionalism of, of stuff, do you, um, like, so obviously you do stuff with TV and radio and podcasting mm. and, and obviously comedy the live circuit. Are there, are there any areas that you would say you're working towards being more str- or stronger in in the next year or two? That um, I mean, one one thing that I haven't kind of, although I'm kind of involved in with the podcasting, but, you know, one area which I want to develop is the whole, you know, the YouTuber blogging kind of, stuff my wife is far enough now become a full-time blogger far enough um she was on my books as an actress bizarrely she's now found an outlet for that by doing this this blogging so i knew that i didn't have enough experience to find her sponsors to do facebook live and brands to come on board so you know she's going to a, a company that just specializes in in youtube kind of uh talent which is a very different thing because you know in comedy someone could be hilarious in their living room in their bedroom put them up on stage and do stuff and it's a different kettle of fish i mean obviously there's people like limmy that have done brilliantly from literally starting in the bedroom but there's a lot out there that you sort of think yeah once you're in front of an audience it's a very sort of different thing so that's one area absolutely i think most agencies will be looking to develop because it's it's still the wild west still people don't quite know where that whole thing is going to go but it's it's absolutely look at the figures alone with tv figures and radio figures going down it's it's absolutely the way forward where an individual will not need a broadcaster they will be the broadcaster they will be the brand they'll go directly to their fans that's what will happen in this industry Mm, and you you run a podcast network yes i do called playback media we started off my business partner started off, um, he had a company called Whippet, which was the, they were the first British download company, almost before Apple and around the same time as Napster. And obviously they got eaten up because iTunes was so massive. So he built a little kind of radio station, little radio sort of desk and got Danny Baker in uh, to do a sort of first the all day breakfast show for a little while. And we had this studio and I was obviously looking after artists and he sort of said, you know, any ideas? I went, well, I'm being a big football fan and I'm working with Phil Cornwell, who's also a big football fan, Cornwell from um, Stella Street uh, fame, Um, Gilbert, Gilbert's Fridge. Um, We sort of said, let's just do a podcast about Spurs and 10 years on, we've now got 15, 16 weekly podcasts, mainly celebrity presented football podcasts, but we do some comedy ones. We've got the Angelos and Barry show, which is Dan Skin and Angelos Epithamu and Alex Lowe's Barry from Watford, which from the podcast has um, spawned a tour now, UK tour. So uh, yeah, that's another side that I'm sort of interested in. Mm. And where something that we were talking about just briefly mm. before we started is is sponsorships and promotions trying to get those monetized because mm. obviously um as you said everyone's scrambling for attention at the moment yeah. in media particularly and uh, I, I think there's a lot of mistrust in mainstream at the moment mm. and so like sort of podcasts and vloggers and stuff seem to be sort of monetizing not monetizing um, monopolizing some of the attention that that might have traditionally gone to maybe newspapers or, or right. um, uh, magazines and stuff w- w- what do you feel is like the the reason why people maybe invest in so for example well I'm not too sure they are yet I still think it's early days there's a resurgence of podcasts they were obviously a bigger while back all went quiet and now there's a big resurgence for them especially in America where they have monetized it much better and it's a bit like if you watch TV you're just used to some adverts now when you watch YouTube you just you used I mean it used to be so annoying it's still annoying but you used to just have to sit through that advert and now a podcast you know when we started when we put our first adverts a few people were like oh, oh no there's an advert your podcast we, we, you're getting this for free how do you think we're all here sitting here paying for it mm. so people kind of used to it and I think I don't think it's sort of It's great for performers who are tired of waiting to be commissioned for this or get a radio show for this. You know, you look at the big comment, you know, Richard Herring, prime example, brilliant talent, been around a long, long time. 
you know, I'm just going to do this myself. And he's monetized it. He makes, I assume he makes the money from the, the live shows he does. It, it's funny, it always goes back to live. I mean, the mm-hmm. podcast we do, our biggest revenue stream is all the live shows. So with the Spurs show we do, well, we're going to one we're going to one live show a month actually and you know some of those depending on the guest the last one we had the ex-manager Harry Redknapp we had 350 people paying 30 pounds each so it's sort of far more than we get in in advert money Mm -hmm. through uh you know companies that you deal with who drop in adverts but it's as I said, people sort of used to it, and it's just it just gives you a bit more control. But again, don't do podcasts out there unless you've got a real love and a real passion to do something. Because I, I think I see now there's a slight movement to performers doing not not like this, which is talking about the industry. But let's do a funny podcast together, and not quite knowing what the market is, who's going to listen to it, how they're going to hear it. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to start now because, as you know, there's so many out there. Mm. And it's a bit like, you know, trying to find a video on YouTube. Where, where do you start? What do you look for? So I think it's a bit, again, it's a bit like the Wild West. There's loads out there, and I think it will sort of settle down. And the ones that can monetize it, maybe do a live show, maybe a bit of merchandising, uh, maybe could morph into more of a radio thing or a TV thing or uh, a webcast thing will be the ones that kind of survive, I think. Yeah, I I think what I found most interesting in, in uh, especially in podcasting, to, well, let's start with YouTube. Uh, the people that I started watching 10 years ago on YouTube, I think the videos I started finding them through wouldn't make it through now right, the front page. Are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting. Because the front page of YouTube originally was just I- individual mm. creator content that was really interesting to yeah. the person who was creating it. But YouTube have got much more hands-on now. I mean, they'll yeah. do deals once you get, uh, uh, it's 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 subscribers. Once you get to that level, you know, they will do deals with you just use their studios in town and yeah. get on with it. So that's kind of... A, a good thing in a way to bell stuff but then other people who don't get to that level who are really niche you know kind of stay in their bedroom but you know again I think like look I'm sure we'll talk about comedy later no no one no one should go into this business thinking they're going to make a fortune you do it for the love and you do it because it's it's a calling it's something within you that you want to do don't sit down and go right I'm going to be a comedian to make lots of money sadly a lot do mm. uh, or I'm going to do a podcast because I'm going to make a fortune it's, it's the wrong wrong reason for doing it Oh, yeah, definitely. The, one of the things that stands out for me is I get a lot of messages from people saying, oh, how do you start a podcast? How do you do mm. this? Just because of the nature of this show. Mm. And one person, I told them, like, sort of, I gave them a list of the sort of, I've got a thing on my website that shows you how to start right. one. And in it, they just went, yeah, I just don't know where I'm going to find, like, an hour, an hour and a half a week to record it. <laughs> I was like, okay. It's more the edit time you need to be worried about yeah. at this point, mate. Like, that's that's the, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, time yeah, yeah, killer. Yeah. Like, not yeah. the recording time. Yeah. And I was like, maybe maybe don't start one now yeah. then. Because it just feels like you're not into this. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a ball. Like, it sounds like he wants, wants you to do it for him, I think. I, maybe, but I'm not. Yeah. I've got enough editing to yeah. do in my life. But it's just that sort of thing where you think to yourself, you know, what's, your, what's getting you out of bed to make you want to do that? Like, yeah. what, what's your actual drive to do that? Because to create a, a quality podcast, mm. I think... It, it now it, it's easier to get the equipment and to get it up online mm. I think than it's ever been but yeah. I think with that you've sort of got people who maybe don't want the, the they're not sort of invested in it in a, in a positive way yeah and it's interesting when you you know there's, there's bigger companies that, that produce podcasts you can sort of see the ones where they've thrown two people together because they think there'll be sort of synergy and, and whatever and there isn't and you can always hear it <laughs> In the people's voices they don't quite know why they're there but they've been told a podcast is a good thing to do again i just don't think that's the right reason to do it but brands i mean it happens a lot a brand will come oh we're you know whoever we want to get this one that one here's some money and so people will kind of do it but not you know literally for the money but uh, not there's much in that yet how so when you're looking so if you're scouting for talent to bring on how what, much podcast we're still talking podcast we, we, we can talk here? both like i don't <laughs> okay, i don't know how much o- overlap there is between the two mm. but i was wondering if you're scouting for a talent for mla or you or you mm. want uh to look for another podcast how much do you take into account like their social following or their social oh uh, you have to a lot i mean with with, with playback with the podcast you, you know we we do i mean most of them we have started from scratch don't get me wrong but when we're bringing one in that's already up and running we bring it under the banner we need to kind of know 
you know how many downloads they're getting so we can then immediately tell them right on that level you will, should be bringing x a month we can cross promote your show with uh, we've got one called geek town which does very well we can cross promote put adverts on that you know we need to have a sort of sense of of where they are and where it can go i mean it's with with the football ones we do you know manchester united are well, I'm not a fan, but are probably the the biggest team in the world. That one is not our biggest podcast, and half their listeners are in the US. Which, when it comes to UK advertising, is an utter waste of time. You sort of like, I can't believe we already bought X in this month because most are overseas. We've got one Glasgow Rangers one called Heart and Hand, which gets about ten, twelve thousand listeners a week, and their the engagement is unbelievable. Their Facebook page is vibrant. Their Twitter page is vibrant. It just they just get on with it. They're just absolutely fantastic. So each one is kind of different, and it's got to be going back to the original question. I think it's got to be that presenter, the person who's doing it. It's got to have that drive. It's you know we've we've got a few shows where you know a well known presenter will just show up and do it. But the best ones are the ones where they're getting their booking their own guests. They're having ideas for their shows. If it comes from within, I just think it's always a better product. Oh, definitely, definitely. And so when you're, and so that's how you scout for like a new podcast. Mm. And if you were scouting for a new client, a mm. live client, for example, or an acting client, something yeah. like that, where where do you even look for those? Well, it, there's there's different things. I mean, on an acting side of things, when you're just putting them up for you know acting jobs, we'll look at our client list and see what we're lacking. You know, if there's a, a, you know a huge you know amount of looking for Iraqi actor whatever I'll go out and try and find an Iraqi actor so we can suggest that person for work with comedy it doesn't work like that way I I, I have to work with people that make me laugh <laughs> I you know I, I you know there's probably many agents out there who will go hmm, don't make me laugh but I know I can make money out of them I, I have to have someone that I really believe in and think they're really really funny to, to, to work with them you, you have to have that joy and passion when you see them because I think when you then talk about your client to industry types that comes across and if they know you they know well, this guy's not bullshitting me he clearly loves this that yeah come on yeah we're going to see him tonight type thing um, so that can come from just people contacting me and pe- me just being in a club and seeing someone thinking oh, this guy's interesting or she's interesting it, it's hard to tell early on because as you know there's loads of comics so I think you know have a tight 10 minutes that's really really good but it's like, how do they develop to the 20 minutes? They've got to get the club gigs, which is not that easy anymore because there aren't many out there that pay or, or, or get big audiences, sadly, to the next level of coming up and doing an hour show in Edinburgh, which, as you know, is a completely dis- different discipline. I think there's too many comedians out there that are getting signed by agencies way before they're ready, way, way before they need an agent. And I think it's kind of ruining the business, really. I mean, you... you Look, you look at all the kind of you know well-known TV famous comedians. The majority of them, in what in their forties, fifties, a comedian needs time and experience to 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 <laughs> to live a bit of a life in order to make jokes about it. You know, largely. Um, so it's sometimes it's hard to. I mean, I've had a few over the years that I've seen them. <laughs> Bless him. There was one. That I think it was Stuart Lee first mentioned to. Um, uh, Sarah Fowl, who used to work at Comedy Central many years ago, this was 98. There was a little pub down from the Pleasance, the something tree. I don't know if they, I don't they do comedy there, but it's as you go down, no, it's not the pear tree, okay. it's literally on the same road as you go down from the Pleasant Cross where there used to be a pub there. And there's a great comedy space there, they had a lot of great shows there. <laughs> I was taken to it, became the sort of comedian's favorite in joke. There was a uh, there was an actor, his name was Dr. Coca-Cola McDonald's, and he was a guy, he was a teacher, supply teacher from Leicester or uh, Derby, whose act was playing a Bon Tempe organ, really weird ditty songs, wearing nothing but a pair of Speedos and a clown face. And it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And that was one just going, I don't know what this is, but let's go with it. But, you know, we managed to get him on uh, Richard Webb, who's a well-known comedy producer, was doing a show called... It was, it, was a, it was a BBC Three thing comedy. It was one of those compilation shows with different acts thrown together and never quite works. But he was a sort of regular on that. So you never know. Sometimes they might have. I mean, I've always quite liked the weird cabaret acts. You know, I've got Frank Sinatra, the Ubermeister of Lounge, who's obviously well known. Uh, Tina Turner, Tea Lady, another brilliant comic creation. So there's some that will just. This is the act. This is what they do. Mm. <laughs> it's not going to develop. That's your gag. Yeah. You know, it's very different to a, a comedian who will, you know develop his work and his material 
I couldn't do character stuff. I got no, I really, it's interesting. Yeah, my, I, I got a review the other day that said his persona, like they were going on about my persona. persona. <laughs> it's I was me, like, I was my like, persona. I was like, this come, is it. come hang out with me for 20 minutes, yeah. you'll see this is not a persona. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite anxious. All I'd the time. use that. I'd use that and go, yeah, this is persona. I'm yeah. not like this at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at home, I'm so it. chill. Like, <laughs> <laughs> at home, I don't even give a, I don't even, whatever. Yeah. No, it was just, it was such a weird moment because like, you know when you get reviewed and you get told something about yourself that yeah. isn't true, but yeah. they think it is because of what they've seen. Or, and, but this and, is how the people might see you, yeah. so Simon. This is it. <laughs> People think, just think you're one big act. Yeah, you know what? I'd prefer it if they thought it was. Because I'm telling you now, I, don't, I do me, and that's it. But I know, but I have friends who do who character acts and stuff, and, yeah. and and I find it really amazing that because you talk to them and they talk about it like it is another person. But isn't that the act? That's the mask, isn't it? It's, yeah. That's the comedy mask that you can hide hide behind and get away with murder. Yeah, that you never do or say yourself on stage. Yeah, it's not me. It, it's it's my creation. Yeah, and that's why so many comedians do it. <laughs> Well, yeah. thing, I, I couldn't do that. Like, if yeah. I if I'm going to go on stage and do a, a joke that is potentially offensive in a mm. in a whatever yeah. way, I'm not going to go. My nan said this. Like, I'm not going to hide behind yeah. some sort of whatever. I'd rather just go. I had this thought. Let's see if you like yeah. it too, because right. it just seems really disingenuous. But if you have put the effort in to make a character up yeah. that has the sort of conceit that will hold it and yeah. keep it going, I think fair play to you. If you've got that imagination and you think you can build a world that someone can be pulled into absolutely I, I can't do it I've just got my own head and yeah. I'm struggling with that yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that um, you, uh, you, if like they were looking for like a, an Iranian actor or like an Indian actor mm. or something like that you'd, you'd go out and look for one how, how much are you really affected by quotas then in, in terms of comedy what do you mean by quotas? So, so like, say, like with the BBC when they brought out that thing where they said, oh, oh we need one woman on every panel oh, show, or, you know, like, how, how much does that really affect your, your day? To, I mean, I seem it, it, it doesn't. It goes back to what I said earlier about I, I sign people I'm generally excited about. You can't. You can't second guess what TV people want. I mean, you know, they, TV people don't know what they want until something they've rejected has done well on another channel. You know, <laughs> whereby we know sketch shows have gone now. Oh, why TV had a Vegas sketch? Show. Let's do a sketch show, or you know, or panel show. Or just do you, you? You can't run your own business just thinking about what you know. Obviously, it's important. You know, you need to suggest people, but you can't sort of second guess what or what they might ask for you just got to have talent with you and it's cyclical things come around and you know your people you've got writers on your books that are brilliant writing sketches and there's no sketch shows for three four years and eventually oh look some sketch shows now dust off those old scripts you know change that it's not Blair anymore you know change that line and <laughs> and then they go so you know it's 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 very difficult otherwise yeah yeah it sounds like it affects you more in the acting field than than anything else because they because they're casting for a specific yeah i mean with that this is it it's all about you know sadly with a lot of acting jobs it's all about the look you might be got there's thousands of talented actors out there that don't get a chance because they don't look right for a particular role it's um that's it if you're going up for you might be iraqi but with ginger hair you're not going to get the American drama playing the Iraqi because you're not terribly typically Iraqi looking forget about it that's the way it, that's the way it goes but I think most actors sort of realise that and realise the strengths they have to sort of work towards in order to, to get work mm. you know? but like you said uh, you know I think I think it would help if that actor had a following on a on YouTube or on a yeah. Podcast. Well, it's well, well comedy is going that way as, as we touched on before with certain YouTubers you see show up on panel shows or reality shows and you're like, who's this? And they go, oh, million subscribers. Oh, so your TV and you're now trying to tap into the internet to get people to move away from the internet to come and watch you. Oh, that's cynical. Okay, you know, and that's that's it. I mean, it's it's staggering that's happening now. You know, you sort of think. God, where I mean, where would certain greats of yesteryear be if they're around today? I mean, really, you know, would you know, would Morecambe and Wise get on television now if they, you know, had to have a successful YouTube channel pranking away at home? Mm. These people, you know, with Tommy Cooper, you know, oh, it's terrible magic, terrible. It doesn't work. I mean, where would they be now if they had to come through the YouTube generation? We wouldn't see these greats, yeah. you know. You can argue, are we going to see those kind of greats again? I, I, I don't know. No, no I, I, it's the same thing, like I said before, where, where the, the people I found originally on YouTube wouldn't make it to the front page or the trending yeah. now. Mm. You think these, these gems that managed to make it through, but then there were less people, I suppose, and it was less um, saturated. and, and Yeah, but, but also there's, because there's less clubs where people can develop their work. I mean, the whole, I mean I've got a client here called Chris McGlade who's brilliant, who's doing... Um, is at just the tonic uh, 11 p.m. every night, and he 
has come from absolutely from Teesside, the northern working class comedy circuit, which he's been doing for 28 years. And now he's trying to well, he's absolutely <laughs> change his material and it's, it's quite political now and thought provoking. But he's got that stagecraft. He can be in front of two people, 200 people. And he's got 28 years of experience of doing some god awful places after the bingo and before the, you know, the meat raffle or whatever. But he's had to the stage time. And you sort of think of people coming through now. Where do you get decent stage time to develop stuff, especially like more variety and double acts and stuff? I know there's the sort of open mic circuit, but you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's so difficult. And then when you've got, you know, we're, we're here now at the Edinburgh Festival and at the end of the festival, you have the, the uh, TV festival and TV people come up, or who should we see, who should we see? It's, it's a different medium. You then got to take someone who's brilliant live in front of 100 people at the Pleasance to go, okay, we now need to develop this into a, a, a TV piece and all that. But again, you know, there's not many... Well, I wouldn't say this might be great, but yeah, but there's, there's not many great comedy producers out there anymore because just the work isn't there. Most have had to go freelance, you know, scratch for, for work. And again, you need that relationship to, to develop them. And I think when you get a name who's already established, oh, we've got so-and-so on our channel, producers are almost scared to go, that's not funny, doesn't work. Mm. For, for fear of losing their job, what are you saying that to the talent for? Let them do what they want to do. And that's why there's so much bad comedy on TV at the moment, because no one says to these people, no, this, this is, just doesn't work. I don't care who you are. This is not funny. I have more experience about you. I know what works on TV. Mm. That's your problem. A lot of TV people, a lot of the commissioners and people that I know in TV say things like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they'd come up to the fringe, they'd see a show, they'd see, be, they'd see how it could transfer to TV, and, it, and, it would, and that's why they'd be looking at the award winners, because they'd go, you know what, that act we could put in this kind of variety show, or this kind of... There's, but there's too much now. I mean, I remember my sort of grounding in Edinburgh from 94 to 99 was working with a company called Polar Jones, no more, Stone Ranger, which was um, with Ed Smith, who's now Phil McIntyre, and my job was getting shows up and helping the acts you know i remember when i mean this is what oh, i can't remember it was 96 so i'm up top of my head i remember armstrong and miller who were unknown that they were doing uh, the pleasant studio and they're getting 20 30 people in the first week suddenly five stars in the scotsman when there was less shows that was it they never looked back they never looked back now you'll get five stars in the scots on the last week and go this is it and people go yeah but there's another 40 shows that have also got five stars so you still don't know what to go and, and develop it was much easier then because there was less around and now because there's more doesn't mean the quality's gone up the quality has absolutely gone down <laughs> you know for the same reason i said before because people can't nurture the stuff but now look it's great with the free fringe and i'm running a free fringe venue frankenstein's on george the fourth bridge some great shows it's brilliant for performers now now who can afford a, it's still expensive but afford now to come and try stuff out here that didn't happen for years but even that shifting there's so many big names now who can sell tickets who are thinking no i'm going to do the free fringe as well because i want the money straight in my pocket and i think kind of that's unfair because the free fringe should be for acts who don't have the profile who can't afford to do the pleasants and you know the gilded balloon you know and that's that's a slight worry it's getting better because i think the quality of venues on the free fringe are getting better but all those really good venues the free fringe are now being taken over by acts that last year were doing the pleasants and the assembly rooms i'm torn on this mm. because i've got a friend he did he did the pleasant oh uh, no the pleasant uh the assembly last mm -hmm. year and I think it's got, I think it cost him about twelve grand to do the show last year. Jesus Christ. I know, right? And it was it was just an hour stand up. You know, obviously did all the you know uh, billboard stuff that you have to do to kind of you know. No, help. you don't. <laughs> I've never ever done it. I, I know. Anyway, you I know you don't. <laughs> That's I know, a waste of money. I should put out. I've never done one. Yeah, and I don't. I don't feel waste like the money. But I feel like I feel like when you're doing a show at that profile, you mm. might feel like you have to do yeah. it. And as everyone else is doing it, and mm -hmm. if you're the one show at the venue that isn't doing it, you might feel a little bit like you're sort mm. of lagging behind. So that's what I mean by you yeah. sort of have to do it. Um, it's more in your head than anything mm. else. You know, and this year this is on the free fringe. Right. And I think Is that because last year cost them 12 grand? Um, it was a big contributing factor there you are. because this year, you know, so l the last show I did up here cost me about two thousand two hundred. It's not and bad, I, and it was on the free fringe. That includes your accommodation. Uh, yeah, but I, mm, I did rent a flat and then rent every room except for the bathroom. Well, well so. done. But there you are. But that's that's <laughs> but yeah. to do something on. I mean, I think still on average, even doing the free fringe with your accommodation and this and that and that, you're still looking at four or five grand. Yeah, yeah. easily. 
Yeah. And that's without going out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Don't, you know, don't, people don't factor that in. You know, at home, do you go out on the piss every night? No, but you do in Edinburgh. Mm. You've got to factor that in as well. But anyway, sorry, you were saying. I, I no, I, you I, I, no, it's, it's <laughs> all right. That's why I'm here. Um, no, I, I was just saying. It, I I can understand why if you're if you're. I mean, the guy's like six years in, six seven mm. years in, and and you know if, if you're that far in. And you wanted to do your hour, and I get it why you'd want to do it at a big venue, and it's you know it's it's nice to a boost to your ego, and it's like oh look I'm look I'm around all these bigger comedians, all that kind of stuff. But I can understand why that might not appeal to a bigger comedian because you might think you know what this is an extortionate price, and I'm paying as well to be in this venue. Like they're, yes. they're, they're a great yeah. venue. Well, there's a lot of big names that still because of the, they're, they're with sell out and still barely see a penny yeah. because of the cost of all the things you just mentioned. Mm. But I think again, we, you know, we live in this small comedy bubble and the you know there's a smaller comedy bubble the edinburgh comedy bubble and when you speak i mean i've been doing the fringe since 1989 when i ran a comedy magazine called the heckler which was the first sort of magazine just looking at comedy stand up then god this god it was a long time ago um and you know it's still to this day it's the locals that come out and buy the tickets and years ago the locals would come out to that first weekend two for one and see what was good now they'll go straight to the free shows find some good free shows tell all their mates and we had last year shows that weren't well known sold out for the rest of their run because the locals have picked it up and it was free and they put you know five pound a head in the bucket afterwards which goes straight to the performer you know and if you're doing the assembly rooms at ten pound a ticket after the split, after that, you're going to end up with the same money in your pocket. But you're waiting till the end of September to see it, and you're not laying out a three thousand pound guarantee to a venue whether anyone shows up or not. That's why it works so well, and that's why I, I know. And we've got artists in our venue who have, have for years did the paid venue and now do the free fringe because they're seeing more money. So I, I, I get why bigger acts are going to the free fringe. I still think it's kind of unfair. <laughs> That, that's mm. it I know it's going to happen and maybe more venues will spring up and other deals are done or whatever you know whereby the you know the the, the, the nobody guy no one's heard of is who comes up to Edinburgh and you know and wows everyone and, and has that opportunity to, to perform somewhere and get an audience That that's what I think would be sad if that goes again yeah no I, I agree with that completely I just I just feel really sorry for, for bigger performers who kind of are, are kind of being pushed into the big four and, and because of the money them. because the reason they're being pushed there is that you know a lot of big agents will obviously have relationships with the big venues they work with them for years the uh, an agent might also be a promoter so they will probably charge their client as producing it a management fee then there's the money on top with you know the the, the, the deals they might be doing on flyers and a street team and all that and you know certain comedy companies make a lot of money during the fringe so that's why they're always going to push their artists no you've got to do the pleasants you've got to do the guild of blue and you've got to do the assembly rooms and all that but i think because there's so many shows and again going back to this comedy bubble most locals on the street apart from the big household names have no idea who certain acts are that we both think oh wow oh we did this he did this great no idea so when they're standing outside the pleasance and going do we see this guy who's got five stars and was on this tv show and that tv show for 11 pounds on a saturday or can i go here and see this guy who flied me in the street and it's free i know what show they're going to go and take a risk on they're going to go to the free, and that's the problem there's I think unless you're now a, what I call a, a comedian that's done lots of TV and is well known, I don't see the benefit anymore of doing the paid fringe. I, I just don't see it for that. You know, and there's so many, it's heartbreaking every year when you see artists that you know and like who have got great shows and are going, getting no one in, getting no one in. I don't know, I'm in the big venue, got my posters, got my street team, just got my PR, um, done loads of press, I just can't get people in. And it comes down to people don't know who you are enough to go yeah i'm going to pay 12 pounds to see you to do a 50 minute show that then and that's what's a, such a shame yeah i i think there's no there's no relationship there between you mm. and that audience mm. to even take a punt on them yeah and, and exactly I'm, I'm the same if, if someone says to me like if three people say to me go and see a show that's a paid one mm. i'll google them and look up what they do mm -hmm. that's that's until that's happened yeah i won't bother but i've come in, i've come out of shows because i always pay for my tickets because yeah. i just Oh no, I, I'm right. talking about paid but, shows. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, okay. I'll pay to go and see. So I might, you might say, check this guy. Really? Oh, I'll, I'll take your judgment. Okay, and I'll pay eight, nine pounds. I'll feel cheated. 
Mm. If that show's not good enough, not worth nine pound now, yeah. I really, really will. I'll just come out going, can't believe nine quid for that. Oh, yeah. Whereas I'll go and see a free show, it might be shit, and I go, all right, take. I walked out and cost me anything. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. That's that's the problem. So I just think it, it's so. <laughs> There's always going to be enough artists who don't know how Edinburgh works and will always pay someone money to stand on a stage. That's the way it's always going to be. And, you know, you mentioned your friend there, 12 grand. I've heard people pay more than that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they're told, no, you must have the PR. You must have this. You must have the big adverts that go directly to the council now. I mean, I mean, the good old days of paying some dodgy scouse guy to put your posters up in the dead of night. That's what a festival's all about. It's so mm. commercialized, even the posters and the size. You can have this and that and that. And, you know, if you dare to blue tack your poster over one of those boom you'll get a call it, i mean it, it's, it's crazy it's it, mm. it's a festival that's just a massive money making machine yeah but not always for the artist no no no, no. Yeah. no very rarely for the artist yeah. unless you sort of you know go this is what i'm you know, you've got to go look uh, if you're a certain artist you want to develop yourself edinburgh's fantastic you should do it but don't go in, go in going, I'm going to lose £5,000. I see it as investing towards my career. That's what I'm going to do. But people go and think they're going to make money and all that and sort of mortgage their homes to do it. It's, it's, it's very, very sad. Yeah. There's pressure they feel under. They have to do that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I've done, so this year I've done seven other comedy festivals. Right. Uh, and I'm going to have three more after Edinburgh. Oh, wow, fantastic. And I just think to myself, you know what, in in four of I've just got the money back from the wedding one so mm. four of them I made a slight profit Great. and I'm just thinking to myself I'd rather look at it as in I'm working towards getting a show that I yep. can take around to these other festivals yep. that I might make a profit on or I might break even on than, yeah. than go you know what mm. Edin Edinburgh needs to make profit on as well because it's such a capricious festival but right? what comedians don't do and we all do it and and you know a you know, <laughs> stand up would go oh doing a Comedy gig tomorrow, 150 quid, great. When you factor in the hours yep. of work and writing and nurturing and traveling, you work that out then per hour and, you know, we're all getting paid less than a cleaner. I mean, that's that's the thing. Yeah. Again, it goes back to it's got to be a love of it. Oh, yeah. You know, it's got to be, it, it, you know, for most performers, it's not a career, it's a vocation. It's a, You know, it's a vocation. It's something you just feel you have to, have to do. Yeah, and I don't, have a problem with people doing it as a hobby i do mm. have a problem with them doing it as a hobby if it starts so like we we're talking about the open circuit before like open right. mic circuit and i do feel like there are some gigs especially in the london open mic circuit that train you to not be good at comedy. oh really do i see know? i don't really know that world i, I you know i don't know how when I, I remember years ago when you had to have an equity card and it was easier for actors to get it to get the cabaret one through spotlight okay so yeah. oh, sorry equity so you could do less jobs like emma thompson that's when she sort of started doing comedy you know in the early days comedists and all that it's quicker to get a, a, an equity card so there was loads of sort of you know you look <laughs> you look back at that sort of alternative the boom of alternative comedy in 1978 79 80 and you look back at where some of them now loads of well-known actors and that's what they did it they they they, they had a funny character idea mm. and they went out there and got their equity card to to get more acting gigs yeah you yeah know? it's it's uh, i who was it i uh it was before a gig i i bumped into i was in like a small room he was in the big room Stuart lee mm -hmm. and i was saying to him i uh, to me, when you talk about the old days of Edinburgh, that you come up with an idea and you mm. hone it over a month, that sounds really yeah, fun. Yeah. But he's like, now oh. I, I come up with an hour. I have to because it's the way yeah, it works. Yeah, you yeah, don't, yeah, I don't yeah. hone an idea. Yeah. I do it the months beforehand. But that's from an agent's point of view, and it's like that whole thing that you, <laughs> when acts do that, the problem is you sort of you try and get industry people to see the preview or show, you know, in the first week. Then they develop it. By the end, it's brilliant. And then you go, but oh, you've got to come back and see the show. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, but it's so different now. I've got too, Mike, I've got too many shows. I can't see it. And that's yeah. the kind of thing. You've got to hit the ground running. Yeah. You know, from now, day one in Edinburgh now, your show has got to be ready because you never know who's going to wander in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of surreal. When I did, I did the Hastings Fringe and I did the Reading Fringe and in those audiences, I got emails the next, like in the week from people and I didn't know they were in. And, 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 and no one asked for comps. But that's with the free so fringe, but the free fringe you don't. No. So if you do the pay show in Edinburgh, you, um, press are meant to fill out a comp form and you go into mm. a little office and go, oh, I've got so-and-so in. 
but with the free fringe, you've, 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 you've no, unless you've got a PR who's kind of knows you've got no idea. No, no. Which I, I think is better for most performers. Yeah. I, I, un, unless the performer specifically says, I want to know when so and so's in, mm. I just don't tell them. I, I just think, why have that added pressure on yourself? Yeah. You've got to be some fun, it's funny to some person who they've never met before that mm. may or may not help your career in some way. I just think it's awful pressure. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. I mean, I, I've done free fringe the last uh, three years I've come up here, and this year I'm on Pay What You Want, which, mm -hmm. I, which I really like as a concept. I like as a concept. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 but the problem is, because it's the first time I've done it, I found when I give them on a flyer, they immediately see £5, and they don't sort of hear, you can come in for free if you wanted to. We've, I've got it at one show with Chris McClare, just a tiny, and Frankenstein's, it's just, we just, it's, we're not part of any... Um, institutions it's just they're free shows and we sort of toyed with it and I just thought I've then got to set up some kind of box office system and bring someone else on board and then the fringe are going to take a percentage of that money I just thought just show up mm. you can always get into a gig in Edinburgh <laughs> if yeah, you yeah, really yeah. want to show up and, and just sort of get in you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and again the shows that are popular you get the half hour before there's a massive queue and that's great you know as a sort of promoter we, we love seeing a queue yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it adds to the buzz of the future of the show because if yeah. someone goes, oh, hang on, we're going Can here, but what's that? that? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, what's the, um, there's that psychology thing of like restaurants used to put you in the window first yeah, 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 yeah. to make it That's look right. more packed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so when you come to Edinburgh with clients, do you have something in mind that you want for them as well as what they're after i mean how does it that depends where they are i mean to many it will just be to do their first hour and get into that kind of mindset and writing mindset to do it you know it might be a, a club comic who is linking his material from the last two years and how you kind of mold it into a show in inverted commas and how you segue and how you link things it could be that it could be someone who just think this is the, could be the right time for them because you know the industry is looking for x y and z let's really go in hard on this it's a mixture really but i say to people if you don't have a show in you don't do edinburgh don't get someone to go oh, you have to do it can't you do that and don't do it don't take this aggravation the cost of it you come up to edinburgh you've got when you've got a show inside you and a show you want to do and a show you want to do for 26 days in a row which is a beautiful thing you know that's why you do edinburgh you know if you just got a idea and so do it do it in london do it wherever you live just you know get a room above a pub and invite you know people along don't do the whole head of a slog mm. because just someone's told you or oh, you need to be seen to do it not true mm. and you you talked earlier about uh having to get the having to get the stage time having to get the hours in and, mm. and live a life essentially mm. to to become a, a better comedian which is something i completely believe in and i think uh you know nothing against a 20 year old comedian for mm. example but i do think generally the ones i like are 40 or 50 years old and yeah they're, they're, they just happen to it's have the only entertainment industry i can think of where the older you get, yeah. the more chance you've got a success. I mean, it's bizarre. I know there's the sort of skinny, pretty boy kind of thing that certain TV channels will use and, 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 and whatever, and brands will use. But, you know, if you're a comedy animate like you and me are, we, <laughs> it, is, it is normally the older men and women yeah. that you kind of find more entertaining. You yeah. know, I, I, I just think of the way it is. I, I found it really interesting. There was a comedian who I gigged with very early on who got picked up and, and was on... Uh, quite a big chat show like, mm. a, like they were involved in that and on their Wikipedia entry it says best known for being part of whatever also does comedy and I was like oh that's yeah. got to hurt him that's got to be uncomfortable because yeah. you're like yeah. that's not what he wanted to be and, yeah. and but, uh, you, uh, you know, know when you're young and you don't know and someone says you need to be sued you, you don't know you're really great you know mm. look if everyone makes mistakes you, you learn from your mistakes well, I, I don't know if you'd call it a mistake but you know yeah. what I mean it's just, it was just a decision and stuff mm. and, and I suppose I mean do you because, because like, like you said, there's sort of some channels that use the young, pretty boy and mm. skin, you know, skinny jeans, all that mm. kind of look. I mean, do you think TV is ageist in the wrong direction? Then, of course it is. You know, you just look. It's just it's always been ridiculous for years. You know, you look at the average age of viewers on most channels, and they're 45 plus, and there's not enough comedy. I work with Jeff Edison, who uh, I was love a Jeff. brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stand-up, lovely guy, great club comic. You know, and he's he's we've got some live shows coming up called Comedy for Grown Ups, <laughs> and you sort of get in free if you're a certain age. I can't remember what the the, 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 the shtick is, but you know, and it's just I want to hear a comedian talk about stuff that means something to me rather than getting a 50 year old man on stage doing stuff about his kids to an 18 year old audience. It never kind of works. I mean, I don't know, I don't go to many sort of 
comedy clubs as much as I used to. I don't know what the average. Whenever I go, it always seems to be people kind of in their thirties. I don't think an 18, 19 year old do they go to comedy clubs? I've no, I've no idea. But it is kind of fine. It, it boils down to kind of finding your audience, really, mm. and finding people who, who who get you. And I think I don't know. That's always sort of quite a difficult connect, really. Just what who's on stage and what is the audience and who who gets what. That's why certain clubs. I used to my favorite club of all time. Long disease with Malcolm Hard is the Tunnel Club. I live in North London. We used to drive every Sunday to Deptford to go to the, um, I think he used to call it the, the Palladium, the Tunnel the tunnel Club. And just because it was my kind of person in the audience, you know, that kind of sort of, I would say punk, but certainly irreverent sort of anything goes style. And you knew every week the acts you'd get would be, you'd love them. And I think that's kind of lacking in comedy now with comedy clubs. You know, I I started running a, a night called The Comedy Happening that we did at the Auburn. It's now transferred to the Soho Theatre. Um, sort of do it every month, every month, late, late night show. And again, because I wanted to go back to that kind of club where you're going to see something slightly outrageous that you're never going to see on TV and you're never going to see at Jonglers. And that's the kind of thing, because I think otherwise you're just seeing so many people doing their, you know, you know standard observational comedy and oh here comes the callback here comes the you you kind of it's comedy by numbers really and i think that's kind of lacking now but i think that's because of tv and audiences have got used to seeing you know heavily edited live at the apollo shows and a certain look and whatever they assume that's what they want to see in tv and most comedy club owners will say will say sadly yeah i have to get from so-and-so's tv show to, to know that I'm going to sell more tickets tonight. So it's sort of, that's why it's affected so many clubs. So it's like chicken and egg, really. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah I think so. Yeah, because once you've been on TV, people, f- but I mean, there are some clubs who say, you know, having a TV name at the headline spot doesn't sell any more or any less tickets we, we have. I think it depends who they are. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> our first, is our first comedy happening? There's me going, oh, this is like the alternative days and all that. And I got a call from someone, Bobby Davo wants to come and try it a new bit. And I went, I can't say no to Bobby Davo. So it was, it was just quite bizarre seeing all this weird stuff and Davo coming out and doing, you know, his old Chris Eubank impression. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing with that is, if you're a club, you're a mm. business, and you do need to know your audience and you need to sort of pick and choose the comedians that will work with that. So I suppose. The extension of that idea would be if you were a performer who wanted to do something a bit more quirky and mm. you couldn't find a space for it, say, at Junglers or Up the Creek or whatever it would be, you could start your own night Absolutely. Now. I, I say to many people, many acts, you know, do it yourself, do a night, put some acts around you. Absolutely. I mean, I don't, I mean, I used to run comedy clubs when I first started out in the, again, sort of 88, 89, had a little club in North Finchley, which Ian Stone then uh, took over, called the Mossel Palladium, and it's fine because I was, you know, twenty-one then, and so I was inviting people at twenty-one, and the acts were sort of the same age, and it kind of worked. I couldn't do it now. I'm, I'm nearly fifty. I couldn't put a weekly club on and expect to get twenty-five, thirty. I wouldn't know what what they liked and what references. I, I just wouldn't go there anymore. Is that you because know? the acts you book are older and you're older? Yeah, and so it's yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I don't. I, mean, I, I, I don't know many 18, 19 year old comedians or if I see them I don't know they're going to make me laugh because I assume they're going to be talking about stuff that it doesn't resonate to me anymore it doesn't mean anything anymore mm. you know I, I don't know you know you've got so many comedians you know doing tinder jokes and this joke and this that oh I'm on this that. no idea uh, you know I, I, I get you know I get the craft of the gag but it doesn't mean anything to me mm. you know also I suppose uh, and I mean this in a nice possible way you've seen a lot so as a yeah. result, it's kind of... You do become like that sad muso <laughs> standing at a gig when you sort of hear a guitar solo and you, you know, turn to your mate, that's very Mark Bolan, isn't it? It sounds very Bolan-esque. You do the same with comedy. You know, the amount of times I've sat at a gig and nudged someone with went, that's Harry Hill, that is. Look at that mannerism. Oh, God, he's watched a lot of Eddie's, our DVDs. And I think that's natural. You know, musicians from... Mick Jagger to David Bowie have taken stuff from Little Richard and James Brown. So there's no reason why a comedian who loves Harry Hill and Eddie Izzard won't, by osmosis, take some of their tics and mannerisms. But they haven't found their true voice yet, their true, yeah. you know, comedy voice until they kind of changed it. I mean, you know, Jack D famously used was quite a, as he says, quite a fun, outgoing comedian, comic. And then one day it was, oh God, I can't be asked to do this, whatever. And they are, his, 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 his persona was created. Mm. So sometimes it takes time to find that voice. Yeah, definitely. 
and and if we were to extend that slightly further, mm. that's where I think online gets really interesting because yeah. you know if you if you could only you only get a certain number of evenings a week that you can gig, mm. but you could make a pod, you, we, I could sit down every morning and make a podcast if I wanted yeah. to, or I could make a video. You know, uh, they, they do those on YouTube. You'd never leave the house, Simon. You never get out. You literally think I leave the have. House? <laughs> you, you have no life now, but you literally have no life at all. Man, I have I have about four friends in the world. <laughs> That I see, and I see them quarterly, individually. Quarterly. It's so bad. One of them I text recently, <laughs> and, and literally their reply was, "Is it my turn?" Oh, bless. <laughs> oh, they, know, they know I just gig, and all I yeah. do is travel. I, d- I don't have anything yeah. else because I don't yeah. care about anything else really. Yeah. Um, so A traveling minstrel. <laughs> Wouldn't go that far, um, but it's 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 insane. But the thing is, uh, and I don't want to say it like this, but you do give up a lot of stuff for this job mm. because you you know, especially like I I do writing right during the day, and then I gig. It's the all evening. consuming. And it's, it's absolutely yeah. all consuming. But I find I find podcasting gives me personally a bit yeah. of a weird release, even though yeah. we're talking about comedy and we're talking about the yeah, yeah yeah yeah. It's quite nice to have a minute. Away it's your from safe space for an hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's why. It's why. I mean, do you not find that when you're doing the football podcast, that you take, you get, it gets you out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and that's and that's where I think the passion comes from. In that, yeah. um, you know, like you said, a lot of comedians do that thing where they're just, you know, oh, oh, podcast big. I'll get an audience from that. And mm. in reality, it's um, it's not that easy. No. Um, well, yeah. Um, I was going to say, what do you think it takes to be a good agent? Cool, oh, dear. <laughs> it's nine a.m., mate. Let's not start yeah, with this. Well, um. I th- I I think you've got to be personal. You've got to be tough when you have to be um, honest uh, with your client and people you're working with. Uh, I think a good ear. You've got to listen, see what people need. Uh, proactive rather than reactive. It's very easy to get so much work. You're just reacting to calls rather than no. Let's think bigger picture. Let's let's think about projects. You know, like in a companies, marketing companies, always thinking ahead about things and i you know i think that's that's a skill that uh you need um i don't know really i mean i just you need to speak to artists about it what they need from their agent communication i mean it's at the top of the show it's amazing how many active friends i've got because i never speak to my agent no i might you know here once every six months and whatever and i'm like really why go for a coffee have a chat so i think you know you you need to sort of you need to get on with them really and get on with your clients you know i can't I, I, I can't represent people I don't like. I, I, I can't do it. I, I, you know, you know, there's, you know, over the years, there've been certain clients with the phone ring. You see their their name come up, and you just go, oh god, oh, and you thought this is wrong. If that's what you're, you should be. Oh great, hey, how are you? You know, you've all got certain people. You go, oh god, when the name comes up, mm. you can't. I, I, I don't want that in my life. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, life's too short. <laughs> exactly. You don't need that. We were talking about the circuit a little bit and how that that sort of. Uh, contracted but also the number of comedians have gone up mm. do you think it's actually possible for uh, uh, let's just whichever comedian you're thinking about right now to make a living off the circuit still no <coughs> okay. just off the circuit yeah. I, I, it depends what you call a living but you know if you just do your Friday Saturdays and a Thursday maybe in here and there I think you can survive but you know you need to factor in that you'll get the odd corporate gig the odd I don't know commercial maybe we're looking for some funny people and this and that and that you know you uh, always i saw Iman yusuf was on advert this morning i've turned the tv on it was some thing was, oh that's uh, well, you know doing some ad you know you, you need these things to supplement supplement your your stagecraft until you're until you can tour i think on your own right or be a support on a big tour where you've got regular money coming over 30 40 dates or whatever doing gigs abroad and whatever i think it's i think just being i mean you look at the very successful club comics they're what doing two three four gigs on a th- friday and a saturday it's constant they have to do that much to bring the money in mm. you know so there, there's not that many doing that i don't think anymore and why, why do you think that is because the clubs aren't there okay. you know you look at the I, I used to work for jonglers years ago for their management arm in 98 99 you know they had seven eight clubs then i don't know i mean i know it's fat it's broken up now with entertain and daryl running the old the, the ding walls in camden but there's just less clubs i mean there's there's the glee and there's some great clubs out there but a lot have gone by the wayside because ultimately a club survives by the amount of people coming the amount of beer they sell you know that's it you know and rate you know especially in london rent and rates have gone up tremendously now tremendously so if you're just you know and again it's identity i mean there's very I mean, there's 
Is is there any six, seven day a week comedy venue? There's a comedy store. Mm. Yes. I think that's all. And maybe 99 Club every day or oh, they top secret. They like might do little Monday, Tuesdays. But there's very few that can operate five, six days a week just on comedy anymore. We're just talking London or are we talking? Uh, probably anywhere, really. I mean, I used to run, my, my background was running mm. venues. Mm. I had um, what was then the Cockney on Tottenham Court Road, which turned into the Improv Club when I took it over. And we had we were flying over American comics on a Friday and a Saturday and I went, this ain't gonna work. And then all of a sudden we put, you know, wrestling in there, live music, anything to sustain it. I mean, the only sort of clubs I can think of where you know what you're gonna see every single night is a lap dancing club. It's the only club you know any day of the week. Mm. Most clubs now, you know, Monday salsa night, mm. Tuesday open spots, you know, Wednesday bingo. And that's it, so you can't just show up you know I love Soho and I love the history of Soho you'd walk into a speakeasy you know whatever it was the Flamingo and know the kind of music you're going to hear every kind of night that's sadly sort of gone I mean there's a few we, you know God bless the comedy store place like that that's still doing it but there's not many out there anymore when it comes to um, say say you had an, a, a client who for whatever reason you know could be that they just don't have the room for them or they're just not interested in them or whatever, couldn't get on TV or radio or anything that would mainstreamly push them forward. Mm -hmm. How would you go about finding their audience without the assistance of... Well, in a way, it has helped because of the whole YouTube internet stuff and podcasting. I mean, that was it. You know, years gone by when you turn around to... And again, there's still not many comedy people you've got to deal with. When BBC, to a lesser degree, ITV, Channel 4... Sky go no we whatever reason we don't want to use that person or we've got something similar and all that what do you do you have to develop you have to write for others uh, do stuff on the internet tour find other outlets for, for your comedy you, and, and I think in a way people having to adapt and change I think is a good thing you know I mean you know the game with, with access the days of the actor sitting at home waiting for the raging ring are long, are long gone you've got to go out and find your own work and develop your own work and find a, a scene in a crowd that likes you you can't just wait for it to happen it goes back to the, the top thing about how you work together it's got to be collaborative it's got to be it's got to, you've got to work together on it you can't just sit and just go oh so no one wants to put me there what am I going to do we'll, we'll get off your ass and try and think of something else and if so, if one of your clients comes to you with an idea going oh, I'd, I'm <coughs> gonna, I would love to develop a YouTube series or I'd love to develop a podcast or mm. whatever how uh, you, you said that like it's kind of um, like obviously podcasts you're quite strong in because you've got that sort mm. of network and you've been in it for a while um, like how, how do you advise them for in in, a, in a, such a different medium to life try it you know you, I mean you're you're the king of the pods uh, you know how it works uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> fucking try it poster. you know do, <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know do a pilot show send it to mates listen get feedback what do you like what didn't you like you know what you know any ideas and just like any like a like a um, set on stage you develop it you nurture it until you get something the great thing about podcasts is you get instant people liking it and whatever and this is great and feedback. It's like any. It's like any creative process. It, 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 it's it is a process, mm. you know. And you get it to a level that you're happy with, and then look, crit if critically and financially, it becomes a success, even better. Mm. But you know, not everything um, artistic has to have a, a, a commercial worth to it. Mm. You know, again, you're 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 in the wrong business if that's why you're doing it. Yeah, no, I completely agree <coughs> with that. Um, so when you but when you take on a client mm. and you and you've seen them live, say for mm -hmm. example, and obviously you would like them to get on a radio or a TV or or, or, or just do something that would make the mm -hmm. uh, profile higher. Mm -hmm. Say you manage to get them on a panel show or, or, or do stand up live or, or mm -hmm. whatever it would be, and they were not as good there as they are live. Well, they're not. I mean, again, you speak to most TV producers of comedy panel shows and they'll tell me loads of times a well-known comic gets on a panel show and just thinks, I'm so and so, I'm now going to sit on this desk. Where's my money? Where's my five, ten grand? And it's like, no, no, this is a different medium. You've got to chip in at the right time. You've got to learn where the camera is and whatever. Waits, whatever that. Come out with the funny quips. It's all going to be in the edit. Everything's going to be edited down. Things filmed for three, four hours. I want you working for the four hours, not just sit there like, well, I'm, I, I've got this gig because I won the Perrier, whatever it's called now, the, the last, last minute dot com. Everyone's you know, just Perrier, sit there yeah. going, I'm going to do it. They won't get booked for another panel show. You know, the ones that know how panel show works will 
end up on a lot of them because they give that producer what and the director what they want to see on that show mm. and that's it so it's yeah it'd be a nice one-off fee but you want it to be more than just a one-off fee mm. you want it to be a regular thing and you want to get to the stage and you go i think you've done enough panel shows this year let's just you know what a bit shit aren't they let's just you know you've, you've done a few now your profile's gone out means now you're developing your tour we can put that there that's going to help sell tickets but you know don't become just known for panel shows which obviously so many comedians have over the years mm. but that's that's probably why because there's a lot of you know i've heard loads of my, uh, my four friends say uh things like oh how come they're only the same like 12 people you see on well, the that's panel that, that's because supposedly comedy tv producers and directors think they're good but also that's because of the absolute laziness of bookers and producers who book talent who again will look at certain agencies certain names or they've been put under pressure you want to book so and so you've got to book so and so for this and all that stuff goes on they'll just be lazy they don't i mean you know there's very few comedy producers i know that will go out to seek out obscure stuff at the fringe and all that they'll just come up for the last couple of days who shall i see at the pleasance who should i see at the gorda balloon who should i see who's got the big posters what should i go and see what's the buzz what's the buzz what buzz everyone's got their own buzz i mean mm. well you know that's the you know the, again because the amount of shows i mean the last time i again show my age but and you know i'm sure there's been many since the last time i truly remember a real buzz from the fringe and i was working for the company that was promoting at the time that someone came about that no one ever heard of and it went oh my god it's so different it was probably johnny vegas that year he did his first show at the gilded balloon the old gilded balloon which is now sort of part of i don't know it's, it's a free fringe venue or whatever the bit that burnt down that was just no one had seen this guy from manchester do this weird rant like having a nervous breakdown on stage while making pottery I mean, it was, <laughs> it was just the bizarrest thing. That was the last time the industry was like, oh, you've got to see this guy, you've got to see this guy. Now there's so many shows, you get a buzz. It's funny now already, day one, you'll, get a bu you'll hear a little buzz about something. And then the week after, that's gone, there's a buzz about someone else. Because there's so many shows. Mm. There is no big buzz anymore, mm. you know. And I think, you know, the comedy awards, you know, it's, comedy is so subjective. I mean, I've, I've sat and seen winners and nominees and I'm scratching my head going, I, 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 I don't get this, I don't get, you know, but it, it, it's subjective. And I never quite understand why, and I've, I've mentioned this to them before, I never quite understand why they don't allow comedy agents on the panel. I, I, you know, they go, oh, because you're voting. Well, obviously, we're not going to vote for our own artists. We won't be allowed to. Mm. But your book, Comedy Producers, who are want to sign up talent and do deals what's the difference they're looking to sign people up in some way why are they allowed to supposedly know their comedy and agents who see it every single day are not allowed to make comment on other people you know come on we're many, many nice people mm. we're not going to you know deliberately stiff a rivals act if they think it's a brilliant show yeah. why aren't they allowed to come and 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 be seen or even ex-agents whatever who've had that background to go and see because we watch a lot of comedy and we know what's derivative we know what's original you know we know what's clever we know we know what's groundbreaking we know what's taking risks and isn't that what comedy should be all about especially life they had that didn't they the, B the bbc got criticized they did the U the yougov um survey where they were like i don't know 80 or 90 percent of the people that took it said uh yeah we we want the bbc to take more risks with comedy because right. it's it's all becoming but very but, but okay there's less of them now most of freelance but again you know comedy producers at the bbc in-house are paid quite well and do they want to uh jeopardize that pay by bringing stuff something in that people go what have you done what is this guy what have you put in they'd rather keep it safe keep it simple take them the pay packet and keep in there you know you know don't, don't, don't raise their head above the pulpit that that's it that is why and, 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 and i kind of understand it I, I i see it there's something wrong in that but that's why people don't take risks the, the channels don't take risk anymore they can't they don't think they can afford to no and, and in a, like you said in a certain way i understand that because mm. if you've got a job and you've got a family yeah. you've got a, a commitment to mortgage or anything you know the amount of over the years we're going to do something different like it's gonna be like the old friday night assassin alive we're gonna do this we're gonna have this oh yeah we're on this well the next minute it's like we need the big household name to host it excuse me but you're going to do well yeah but we we think we need sounds to host it so actually we're going to get some bands on now that are quite well known and sing and it just the whole thing just changes again yeah. and that always happens um well these, these are quick fire last okay. questions if that's all right um quick fire for me take as long as you want but yeah i understand um well i'll ask you the question that i was going to ask you at the start then um what is the best show you've ever seen in the, in the fringe 
I keep it deliberately vague. Oh, the TV God, show. Oh, wow. Well, well, bloody show. hell. That's so for the best I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like any animat, there isn't just one. Ones that stick out as a kid seeing Spike Milligan live at the, um, oh, God, Dominion. Uh, see Billy Connolly live somewhere in London when I was a kid. That was amazing. The Johnny Vegas one I mentioned a while back when he first hit Edinburgh. Amazing. The League of Gentlemen, the year they won that, that was lovely and refreshing to see when they won that show. Uh, non comedy, there was a, a play in Edinburgh, Hurricane at the Assembly Rooms, which was about one, one man show about Alex Higgins, the snooker player. That was a real tour de force, as they say. That blew my mind. Oh, God, there's so I many. That's, that's the ones just off, off the top of my head. That's right. Um, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made and how did you ever come? Oh my god, biggest mistake I ever made. I love at the top of the I'll tell you what it is, getting into this fucking industry it must be <laughs> mental, mental. That was the biggest mistake I ever made. That's a sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that, uh, about what you do? But what we do, that uh, don't trust your agent, they're sharks. Uh, oh, that's all about the money. Um, they'll do a deal if it suits them. All that utter nonsense. You, you can't keep, you know, I've been doing this now. Oh, God. Uh, 17, 18 years? You know, I, you know, you, you, you can't. You can't do it that way. Many do and many disappear. There's always these sort of shining lights, these people who come forward, the new comedy thing, they sort of fall by the wayside because they're just not very good at it and not in it for the right reasons, mm. I think. I think any kind of long-term thing, you've, you've, got, to, you've, you've, you've got to have a love for it. You, you really, really do. I, I, thankfully, I, I've met very few agents that you think you've no interest in your clients. You're all about the deal. Most love the people they work with and, and love the industry. Mm, definitely um, <coughs> who do you think is the most underrated person in the comedy industry wow good question the, the, I think there's, there's a multitude of difference I think small club owners the ones who sort of promoters that I you know still do a little bit of people who promote who will get a room above a pub and work out they're going to pay their artists a fixed fee of or agree on a door split and no fucker shows up and they're the ones out of their pocket not only are they working for free that night's actually costing them money I think that's lovely uh, I, I think they they for, to, to keep the comedy industry going that's the grassroots that cannot die uh, you know so I think they're the kind of unsung heroes that barely get a mention it was really sweet actually I went to the Scottish Comedy Awards a couple of nights ago at Le Monde and there was various awards and they were doing awards for you know best small club and big club and all that it was lovely to hear these sort of small clubs getting the recognition the comedians going yeah you know whatever you, you gave them a first chance I think they're, they're, those people I think are, are fantastic because they do it for the love they're not doing it for the money <laughs> they are they're stupid <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you think is the biggest problem in the comedy industry and how would you go about solving it Biggest, wow, good question. You've done this once before, haven't you? Yeah. Look, hype is, you know, something which is always works in show business. And I've got a lot of good friends who work in PR. And I know it's all smoke and mirrors and hype. But sometimes that can be annoying when I think certain comment comics are getting ahead rather than other more talented ones because of certain hype around them. Um, that kind of you know uh, annoys me really that that still it's all, I know it's always happened but it, it happens even more so now that certain people we push and you're like there's nothing behind you come on mm. but that happens a lot what was the question again because I might have another one for it you was, uh, what, what else annoys you what's, no, what's the biggest mistake so what's the biggest problem in the comedy industry and how would you go about solving it okay so, so that was the one the hype and the other one again the biggest problem is is live venues that can nurture artists that are ready to perform to ready to develop you know, I mean, you took about the Arts Council and funding. And, they, you know, I know it's cutbacks, but they still fund a lot of money. When you read about what goes into the comedy industry, what's, you know... I know so with theatre do great work with certain groundbreaking writing. That's a case in point. But actual, like, proper comedy clubs that people can go in. Maybe, like, community centres that are going to do the stuff that will do subsidised comedy teaching, how to write, how to just be more... Um, confident as a person whatever the sort of angle you need to use to get the money i think that would be lovely to sort of see you know we've got such a great british tradition of comedy we're still one of the greatest exporters and purveyors of comedy and it worries where the next wave of 
true greats are going to come if you don't give them that opportunity and, and chance to to perform and take risks. I think that that's that's a real concern. Okay. And last question: uh, If you had one bit of advice for a comedian who wants to get an agent, what would it be? <sighs> think why you need an agent. What do you need an agent for? If you just need more gigs, that's it. And you think you're a level, you want more gigs. There's booking agents. There's people that will just find you little gigs and book them if that helps. You know, if you're a level where, right, I, I now want to write for others. I know what I want to do. I know I'm good enough. Then, you know, speak to agents who will hopefully give you the time of day and kind of help, really. You know, I, I get, again, I think with this industry, and you don't know because it's developing. I think there's so many comedians on the circuit who are potentially great writers but not great performers and there's some comedians on the circuit who I think are great performers but not great writers collaborate speak to writers people you like you know collaborate with other people let's sort of share the love a bit in this industry and work together you know and I, I think more of that I think would be good and maybe a good agent can can help with with you collaborating with others and people you get on well with and working together rather than this comedy being such an insular no me 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 i'm at home and all no not oh he's nicked my gag and all, all, all that stuff that goes on mm. you know all right well thank you very much for coming on thank you simon that was mike i have got a lot of time for anyone who goes out on their own to work for themselves knows where they're going and what they want to do and what they like and believes in the power of community and connecting with people over the internet through free content and he is all free which meant i love chatting to him and i found the podcast network idea really interesting it's something i wanted to do for a while but it's not something i've quite found the right place for this podcast and uh, you know it, I've got control issues, which means I totally like remaining independent as well. But it, I just love the idea of networks working together. It, it, it means there's a community of creators creating better content for the different audiences they have. It just makes sense. If you've got any value out of this, please do share with a friend who might also enjoy it. It really helps out with the downloads, which means that we get more downloads, which means that when guests ask, which is few and far between, but when they ask what numbers I get, it means I can brag about them a bit, which means they get impressed and then they want to come on, and it just helps out. So if you're impressed by the caliber of guests I'm getting on and you want to help it out, please, please pass on the message of the podcast or recommend a show. If you particularly like this one, do that. Uh, if you'd like to tweet Mike and say thank you, please do. All of his details are in the show notes it's nice to be nice so uh, this this industry could use more positivity going around so please do thank him if you've enjoyed this and got any value out of it also um, Christmas is coming why not plug my book Simon uh, my book is on sale on Amazon it is £5 it's called How to Make a Living by Working for Free and it's all about building an online audience for your content and it has extra information that this podcast didn't it goes into detail and it has interviews with performers who have already done it and it, it's got loads of information in it so if you like support me and you want to buy a copy of the book you can do that there that would be really appreciated and uh, also you know consider it your donation for the podcast if you wanted to donate and you want something for your money buy a book you can buy it on my website as well uh, simonkane.co.uk forward slash shop if you're new here please do hit the subscribe button if you're old here please do consider giving us an honest review in itunes and either way if you'd like to give a donation just to keep the show going um, this show lives or dies on donations and the support of the community of the listeners. So if you have one pound to say thank you for this episode, just a pound, I'd massively appreciate it. If everyone did it, we would be somewhere towards getting breaking even. So if you can't afford it, don't donate. If you can, if you can spare a pound and it's just sitting in your PayPal doing nothing, send it my way. Uh, it would really appreciate it. Uh, at simonkane.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for donating. And thank you very much for sharing if you do. The Ask the Industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet. All elements were created by me, comedian Simon Kane. If you'd like to contact me about anything related to the show, you can tweet me at this made me cool or email me simon.m.caine at gmail.com. And I'll see you all in about 14 days' time. Bye!